Let us open our Bibles to the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 10. John's Gospel, chapter 10. Let's read verse 27. John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice, and they will follow me. Can you read verse 4 and verse 5 as well? And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice, and a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. We can see from these verses how Jesus himself is highlighting the importance of hearing the voice of God. Today, I want to share with you a simple and yet a very important message. It is about hearing His voice. Hearing the voice of the Lord is a very important prerequisite if you want to be caught up when Jesus comes. Only those whose ears are tuned to the voice of God can hear the trumpet sound because the trumpet is his voice. If we are not used to the sound of his voice today, we will miss the trumpet when he comes. All through the Bible, we understand that our God was speaking to his people. Only a living God can speak. There are many gods, but only a God who is alive, a God who is real, can speak. All other gods are make-believe, the creation of man. All other gods have been invented by man, but the true God alone, he is God, and he speaks to his people. But do his people listen to his voice? We see in the word of God how God challenges, he challenges boldly that other gods are dumb. They don't speak. For example, if you turn to Psalm 115, Psalm 115, if you read verse 5. They have mouths, but they speak not. They have mouths, but they speak not. Yes, they, are, they worship other people. They set up their idols and they worship these idols. These idols have mouths. You shape them like a human being. But they cannot speak to you. You speak to them, they have ears, but they cannot hear you. You stand in front of them and you bow down, they have eyes, but they cannot see you. Prophet Elijah was on Mount Carmel. And we know that incident where the prophets of Baal gathered around him. And he challenged them. All right. You first pray to your God. And you ask him to speak to you. Let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 18. And just see how boldly Elijah challenges these prophets. 1 Kings chapter 18, 26 to 29. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning, uh, even until noon, saying, O Baal, Baal. O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leapt upon the altar which was made. Can you see here? They are calling from morning to evening. They are calling on the name of Baal, saying, O Baal, speak to us. But they heard no voice. Then they acted crazy. They began to leap and jump. Almost like Pentecostal people. Okay, carry on. 
And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Cry aloud! Elijah is now so boldly mocking them. Go on! Shout louder! Isn't he a god after all? Either he is talking or he is perceiving or he is on a journey or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awake. You see, he is mocking. Your god, you know, maybe he is on another phone call. Or maybe, is he at home? Maybe he's gone out or... Or maybe he's sleeping. How boldly Elijah challenged them. You know why? Because he had the confidence that his God speaks to him. He had that assurance. And the more he taunted them, the more they reacted. In the next verse. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. Hmm. And it came to pass when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. Can you imagine that scene? What a terrible, gruesome, macabre scene that was. People, they first prayed, no voice. Then they shouted, no voice. They screamed, no voice. They leaped, no voice. Finally, they cut themselves with lances and knives. And still there was no voice. Why? Because Baal is not God. There is no such God. And they were worshipping a dead God. Now, come down to us. We worship the living God. But do we hear His voice? This may be a sermon. But let every believer take this personally. Do you hear the voice of your God? Do you have the assurance? Can you say, my God speaks to me? Look at that first verse again. What does Jesus say? He says, my sheep Hear my voice. Let me very clearly tell you, what does hearing the voice of God mean? It reveals our intimacy with God. Hearing the voice of God reveals our relationship, how close we are with Him. That is why He says, My sheep, my sheep hear my voice. Sheep who belong to him, you hear his voice and you will know his voice. My father had a, a painter, my father was a civil engineer and this painter, a very beloved painter, uh, a, a faithful man, he would come to my father every morning for counsel and my father would instruct him what to do. Now when he came home, he did not know how to address my dad because uh, he wanted to respect him and he didn't know how to call him. So what he would do every morning, he would stand at the front door. Of course in India, doors are all open, you know that. He would stand there and do... <coughs> he would clear his throat. That's it. But even that we knew. We were so used to him. We knew the sound of his voice. He didn't have to say anything. He just had to clear his throat and we knew who it was. We were so used to that voice. We knew the voice. Jesus says, they know the voice. They can recognize the sound. Even if he doesn't speak, if he laughs or he coughs, you will be able to know that he is speaking or Jesus is there. So, how many of you here have this assurance? You come for meetings, it is true. But my question, now if I can write down this question on your heart and underline it, I would do it, but I cannot. But I want you to pay attention. Think again. Do I hear the voice of God? Can I say, this is what God is speaking to me? If we don't hear the voice of God, it means we are not His sheep. Because my sheep hear my voice. If we don't hear the voice of 
Jesus, we are not his sheep or we are not having a relationship with him, then whose sheep are we? We are like wandering sheep. That is why he spoke of a little flock because there is a bigger flock. In the church there is always a big flock of believers. What do they do? They come for meetings faithfully. They come, they go, they come, they go. Years pass and they come and they go. Catch that believer and say, Do you hear the voice of God? No, I don't hear. They say it very pathetically and that is the end of the matter. Do they go back and think about it? Even after this meeting, how many are going to bother? How many are going to think? Not many. For some, the sermon, once the sermon finishes, they get back to their normal life. It's just like going for a Sunday film. Go there. If it's a thriller, sweat. If it's a tearjerker, cry. If it's a comedy, laugh. And when the film's over, grab your popcorn, walk out and then go and sleep. That's all. It's just like attending a film. But dear children of God, my question is this. If you don't hear the voice of God, what does it mean to you? It means this. It means you are not his sheep. You are not that little flock in the church. You are the other sheep and you have nothing with him. He doesn't know you. You don't know him. You know the church. You know the people in the church. You may even know the servant of God. But you have no relationship with your God. But those who have that relationship, that little flock, they know his voice. He says, you are my sheep. He looks at each one and says, you are my sheep. And what does the sheep reply to him? What does the sheep reply to him? You are, you are my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And what does that last verse say in that psalm? I will... Dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In other words, I am going to New Jerusalem. I am going to be in the kingdom of God. Why? The Lord is my shepherd and it ends, I will dwell in his house. Can you see that intimacy? Those who hear the voice of God will dwell in his house forever. Or hearing the voice of God will take us at his coming. Therefore, let us all examine ourselves. Do we hear his voice today? Or have we never heard his voice? Or have we stopped hearing his voice? How many have never heard the voice of God? I'm not saying hearing the voice of the servants of God. I don't mean listening to prophecies in the church. There even if you shut your ears you'll hear it. I mean the voice of God. You know that God is speaking to you. You know God is speaking. You have that assurance. You have that fear. My goodness, God is speaking. God is speaking to me. If you don't have that experience, something is seriously wrong with you. You may be in church and you can carry on like this. There are a lot of things to help us keep carrying on. But in the end, you will be the loser. Some husbands will say, my wife listens and so she tells us what to do. Good. You're good that you have a wife like that. And when Jesus comes, do you think you're going to hold on to her little toe and find a place up there? You won't. At the coming of the Lord, it's individuals who will be caught up, not families. I've told you before, when I was a little boy in our home praising, very often my mother would bring this point out. She said, if you don't hear the voice of God, then you have got something of Saul in you. That used to always speak to me. And I did my own research and probably some other time we can study that. But one thing we understand about Saul. He was a person who had a relationship with God. You know, the Bible tells us that Saul was a Pentecostal believer. Did you know that? You read First Samuel chapter 11 verse 6. 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 6. Just the first part, what do we read? And the Spirit of God came upon Saul. Yes, that's enough. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul. The definition of a Pentecostal believer. And what did Saul do? He didn't just receive the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that actually he prophesied. He prophesied. He had gifts. He had so many 
beautiful qualities about him. But there was one outstanding quality about Saul. He never obeyed God. He always did his own will. He was a good man. He was a leader. But one thing, he would never want to do God's will or even seek the will of God. He would do his own will. Always do his will. He would rebel against God. Days passed by like this. The Spirit of God came upon Saul, we read. Now you read 16.14. First Samuel 16.14. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. What a tragic story this is. The Spirit of God came upon him, now the Spirit of God departs from him. For, six, for five or six chapters there, we see God trying, working, trying to speak. But Saul would not listen. He wasn't even interested. That is how some believers are. They will sit throughout a meeting, but not one word goes into their ears. Nothing, they understand nothing, they hear nothing. What happened to Saul? The end of Saul was a tragedy. A tragic end. That is why we must be very, very careful. Some say, yes, I'm a Pentecostal believer. How do you know? Because the Spirit of God came upon me once upon a time. Is the Spirit still with you? When did you last get a mighty anointing? When did the Lord last speak to you? You may say, but the servant of God loves me. That is what Saul's testimony is. God came, God went, but Samuel didn't leave him. Samuel loved Saul. And if you read between 11, chapter 11 and chapter 16, you'll see Samuel is crying many times. Samuel is crying all night, one full night, Samuel didn't sleep. He's crying for Saul. Finally, God got fed up and said, Samuel, get up. What are you crying like this for? Stop crying. Stop praying for him. Oh, that is a terrible thing. Maybe God's people love you and you are satisfied with that human love. But dear child of God, you must hear God's voice. This is the church of God and we are the people of God. And our God is a living God and therefore we must hear the voice of God. I want to share with you seven ways in which God can speak to us. And in at least one, if not all seven, at least one of these seven ways we must hear the voice of God. If we do not hear that voice of God, don't be satisfied with your Christian life. I used to always be tormented with this thing. Everybody around me testifies, the Lord said this, the Lord said that, the Lord spoke to me. I said, God, I'm so privileged, you have singled me out not to speak to you. Can you please say something, say something, please speak to me. How many nights I stayed up in tears asking God to speak to me. How many nights have you stayed up asking God to speak to you? Some stayed up to watch a film. Some stayed up to enjoy a good meal. They'll go to sleep at 1.30 after eating well. People who go to sleep at 1.30, they don't wake up at 6 o'clock. They wake up at 9.30. Their life is topsy-turvy. Family is there. Work is there. Food is there. News is there. Everything is there except God. No God in their lives. The Lord came, the Lord went. Don't say blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord has left and departed, probably even not in the house. But who is there to bother? Who is there to care? Food is being provided. Everything is happening. Life is carrying on as normal. But where is your God? You must hear His voice. The first of the seven ways through which God must speak is the word of God. Either while reading the word of God. That is why it is a good practice for you to read the Bible daily. You must have a Bible reading record. 
an annual planner, your planner, and use that to follow the daily Bible reading. They have been prepared by the saints and given to us. And you must read the Bible. But so many believers, the first thing they wake up in the morning, listen to the news or watch the news or check their mails. Except God, everything else. The word of God must be read and there are times the, the word of God which has been read and memorized and has been stored in the database in our heart. The word will come back to us at the right time and speak to us. We must have that experience of the word of God speaking to us. Many do their Bible reading. I've told you before as a little boy my parents used to force me. You must read the Bible. You must read the Bible. Others you can't face the day. And when my, my father bought that table tennis set for us, I was so keen to play, my mother said, no, you read the Bible first. And I told you, that's when I discovered Psalm 117 was the smallest chapter in the Bible. My brother taught me that. He said, I said, oh, I've not done my Bible reading. He said, read Psalm 117. And when mom asks you, say, yes, I read a chapter. Did you read a chapter? Yes, I read a chapter. Psalm 170. Many read their Bible like that. It's just, you know, it's like people rushing to work. It's such a fast-paced life. It's a rat race, isn't it? So they don't even shave in their house. They go while traveling in the car, they shave. Have you seen people? I've seen people on the road. They're shaving in the car. Why? No time at home. Then they open their bag gobble a sandwich all on the way to work why no time like that mobile prayer also no time to sit down give no time to give to god in the mornings everything is a rush why because you wake up late you wake up at your own time there is no word of god in your life there are two greek words used for the word of god one is called logos the other is called rima Logos and Rima. Logos means the written word, the, the printed word in the Bible. That's Logos. Now that's a dead word. It's, it's, there's nothing in it. It's just a printed word. But Rima is when that printed word from Logos begins to speak to you. That word begins to speak to you. It's a word that is there in your Bible all the time. But suddenly it leaps out of its pages and begins to communicate with you. It's a word coming alive. How many of you have had that experience? I remember in my own life, the first time I had that experience. There was this verse hanging in the wall. That is why we put up the word of God also in our homes. Some homes... You don't find any word of God. You find all these wonderful pictures everywhere, just like a worldly house. But no word of God. Nothing. Pictures and pictures and pictures and pictures. But no word of God. But my parents would always put up the word of God. And one day I was in my room and suddenly this frame hanging on the wall which was there for so many years. And that thing just, I just felt it popping out of its frame, the words, and coming directly at me and hitting me. And I kept looking again and again and again. And the words were this, I have chosen thee. I have chosen thee. And that kept on speaking to me. That's from Haggai 2.23. I have chosen thee. It was there all the time. But that written word, Logos, became Rima for me. It became a spoken word. God began to speak to me through that word. Dear child of God, you must hear the voice of God through Rima. The written word coming out to you. That is how God can speak to you. That is how God can guide you for your daily life. If you are not listening to that voice, the Rima voice, don't blame God. Don't say God doesn't speak to me. You are not reading your Bible. You are not listening. So many believers, you have lost, you neglected that experience of reading the Bible. Your Bible is cast aside. There is no more Bible reading. 
And the sad thing is you've married a person just like you who doesn't bother to correct you. Your wife sees you backsliding and she doesn't bother because she's a backslider herself. Both of you made for each other to destroy one another and there's no Noah in the family to save the family. Your ark is sinking and there is nobody there to lift you up. If there is no Bible reading, no family devotion, God help your home. God save your family. How will your children learn when they are being brought up by backsliders? Don't say I heard the voice of God many years ago. That's not going to help you. This is a daily experience. Secondly, God sometimes speaks through an audible voice. That is also the voice of God. That is also the word of God. And it's also in the Bible. The written word is Logos. The written word that speaks is Rima. The audible word is Phonio. That's the Greek word used, Phonio. And an example is Acts of the Apostles chapter 9. If you want to make a note of how the written word speaks, you could uh, note Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. This is all part of the New Testament, Acts of the Apostles chapter 8, where we read of the eunuch, how he was driving the chariot and the written word was speaking to him. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8, um, 32. And you don't have to read it now. But let's go to the second part of it, which is, the audible voice, Acts chapter 9, verse 4. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now, this was not from the Bible. Saul was not reading the Bible, nor had he memorized scripture. He was an anti-Christian. And out of the blue, for the first time, he heard an audible voice speaking to him. A voice that produced sound waves. That's an audible voice. The sound entered into his ear and reached his brain and his brain processed the sound and made sense to him. An audible voice. He heard a voice speaking, calling him by his name. God doesn't speak all the time to everybody using an audible voice. But there are occasions where he speaks. There have been many, many testimonies of Beautiful testimonies of children of God who, who used to hear an audible voice. My mother used to tell me about the senior sister there and the beautiful ways in which God used to speak. And one day my mother had an urgent uh, thing in her heart. There were things in her heart she wanted to confess. To, to share with the servant of God and she said God I don't know if this is your time or I don't know what to do but Lord if this is your time let your servant come and stand outside and so strangely her name was Jemmy Sister Jemmy came out of her room and came walking fast as though she was on an errand she walked at a fast pace came and stood under a tree Dropped her hands and just stood like that. A very strange sight. So my mother said, all right, since she's come out of her room, I'll go and speak to her. So she said, sister, you know, I had prayed less. And she laughed. Oh, no wonder. I was so, I was amazed. Now I was sitting in my room doing something and the Lord said, go and stand under that tree. Now that is phonio. That is an audible voice. I know of many believers also who hear the audible voice of God. So if it's not through Rima, then it should be through Phonio. One day I heard this audible voice when I was a little boy. I was just in the house when suddenly I heard this voice. It said, say Amen to all my ways in your life. I thought, what does that mean? The, my initial reaction was, who said that? 
Who said that? Then I knew there was nobody else there. And then I didn't even know the meaning of Amen. Amen means so be it. That is why at the end of a prayer we say Amen, meaning so be it. God says, say Amen or accept or acknowledge or just say, so be it Lord, to all my ways in your life. How many of you have heard that audible voice? It is a precious experience. When God speaks to you, then you have a one-to-one -one relationship with God. You don't have a relationship with David Norris or Ender Kelly. You may see them, you may hear them, but you can't talk to them. Many of you have such a relationship with God. God speaks in the church, that's enough for you. But what about you personally? One to one between you and God. Otherwise, how can you say, I know him and he knows me. So we must be able to hear the voice of God clearly. God communicates even with little children. How many children here hear the voice of God? I doubt, I doubt because if parents don't, how will their children? Many parents here don't. I don't expect much from your children either. The third way that God speaks is through prophecy. If you turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. This charge I commit unto thee, O Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. According to the prophecies which went before on thee. God had spoken to Timothy through prophecies. What is prophecy? Prophecy is when the Spirit of God urges someone in the church to give out a message. It doesn't have to be a servant of God. God uses believers also. And God speaks very clearly through prophecies. There was a time when I was waiting upon God concerning my future, concerning my calling. And I said, God, I, if you want me to serve you, if you have chosen me for yourself, Lord, I want you to speak to me. I want you to speak to me. And there was this particular occasion uh, where there was a particular sister and she was a prophetess. And uh, when she prophesies, obviously, things uh, people were really scared because her prophecies were very specific, were very direct. And she could suddenly come out and... Her, her, even her voice was not a normal voice. When she started prophesying, it was like the growl of a thunder. And she would come out with things like, 27 days, I'm going to judge you if you continue to disobey me. It was something so specific, something so direct. And so, in a tearing meeting, when they heard the growl of a thunder, people started fastening their seatbelts. They knew, oh boy, we are in for trouble now. We're going to hear something very direct, very specific. And I still remember one tearing meeting when the growl of a thunder was heard. It was towards the end of that meeting, just about five minutes more, and we heard this thunderous sound. And we thought, what on earth is she going to say? And she began to prophesy. And towards the end of the prophecy, she said, My son, I have chosen you. And I remember those words that had were hanging on the wall. I have chosen you as the son of Levi to purify you, to choose you for myself. You are mine. And I knew those words were searing like hot laser beams piercing into my heart. And I said, God, I know you're speaking to me. I was so happy and I was rejoicing. And then I stopped. You know why? Because everybody started rejoicing. Huh. I said, now everybody's claiming it for themselves, so how do I know it's for me? But still I knew it was for me. In my heart I knew God was speaking to me. Anyway, I just, 
I wrote it down and one of the many things that God had spoken to me. The meeting had finished. My mother, after the meeting, she was walking up when somebody ran up to her and held her hand. Sister, sister, I want to speak to you. She turned to see it was this particular prophetess. And she said, you know, um, how old is your second son, Rohit? How old is he? She said, why? No, I just want to know. And she, so when my mother gave the age, she laughed. My mother asked, why? She said, because that prophecy was for him. Because after the prophecy, God told me something which I couldn't say. He said, this prophecy is for the second son in a family. And Rohit's face came before me. In my heart, I knew that God was speaking to me. This is how God speaks even through prophecies in a meeting. This is a Pentecostal experience according to Acts of the Apostles chapter 2 verse 17. When God began the church in Acts 2, what did he say in verse 17? 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith the Lord, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Prophecy is one of the gifts of the Spirit, and it's an important ministry in the church of God. Where are the prophets of the church? We had a tearing meeting last night. Praise God, the Spirit of God moved, but there wasn't a single prophecy. Why? Because the channels were blocked. When the channels are blocked, the water can't come through. If you are sanctified, God will speak through you. He wants to speak. You don't know how desperate God is to speak. Do you think God just sits up there thinking, okay, I'm going to keep quiet today. God wants to speak. He wants to speak. He wants to speak. But if the channels are blocked, clogged with earth, filled with the earth, then the water of blessing can't flow through. That is why I urge all those who have the gift of prophecy, when you come for a tearing meeting, come to be used by God. Come to be a channel. I know when I say this, a lot of emotional people get stirred up. That weekend there will be seven or eight prophecies. That's why in watch night service you get a thing. Because three days of fasting, if that's the only way hereafter, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, compulsory fasting for the island assembly. Then Saturday we'll have a good tearing meeting. But that's not the way. You are a Pentecostal believer. The Spirit of God is in you. When you're coming for the tearing meeting, how do you come? Half an hour, your two hours you spend there watching this, watching that on the computer. Then, just before you come for the meeting, have a good meal, your belly full. On the way, argue with your wife. And then, come for the meeting. What do you expect? By the time you repent and put your life right, the meeting is over. Somebody has lost because you did not prophesy. How many lives have been saved through prophecy? How many people have profited through the gift of prophecy? Therefore, do not be a person who prophesies once in two years or once in a year or some great annual event. But be Used for God's glory. After all, it's a ministry that anyone can do. Remember, this also what my mother had told me. She said, when she was a new believer, God gave her a special anointing and she was filled with the power of God in a meeting. But she didn't have the courage to speak. So she would get filled in the spirit and kept quiet and kept quiet and kept quiet and kept quiet. Finally, the pastor gave out the message and after the meeting he rebuked her sharply and said you were not doing God's will in the meeting you should have spoken she said oh I was so scared some people say oh I'm so scared I'm so shy that's not, that's not humility that is pride that is pride it's your pride that prevents you from speaking out for God therefore if you have received the Holy Spirit then you must ask the Lord, Lord, please stir up the gift of prophecy in me. I want this gift. I want to speak. Be used by God in His house. Don't always be one who receives. Be one who gives also. The fourth way that God wants to speak to us is through visions. 
If you turn to Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter 16 verse 9. Acts 16 verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Here Paul is seeing a vision. What is a vision? A vision is what a person sees. He is awake, but he is in prayer. And as if on a screen of his mind... He is watching events unfurl. He is watching things happen. And as they happen on the screen of his mind, God is speaking. Here, in a vision, Paul sees something. Later, Paul discovered it was something really happening. You must ask God, God, I want to see visions. That is also a Pentecostal experience in Acts chapter 2. If you continue reading from where you left off, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. Your young men shall see visions. Seeing visions is a Pentecostal experience. It happened on the day of Pentecost. It's a prophecy. God has prophesied and said this will happen. He, he said this in, through prophet Joel in the Old Testament, and it has to be fulfilled in our midst in the New Testament. You must see visions. Even in the Old Testament, we see how Daniel... He used to see visions. And in addition to seeing visions, there's also an, uh, an experience which not all will have, where it's very, very rare, but there have been people, and that is called going into a trance. If you turn to chapter 10, Acts chapter 10 and read verse 10. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And verse 11. And saw heaven open. Okay, okay. So this is more than a vision. It is a, a special experience, a gift to given to certain people where it's not just seeing a vision. But this is a very specific experience. It's almost like an out-of-body experience where they see something very clearly. And I remember once it was shared when one servant of God went into a trance. It was a sister... And she was in a prayer meeting and suddenly she just fell back. And people thought she was unconscious or even died. But they knew she was alive and she was lying like that for many hours. The sisters around her panicked and they started praying for her. But they were able to see something visible. First, they saw her face and a darkness came upon her face. And it was so frightening. After that, the darkness left her face and a brightness came upon her face. And by the time she awoke to consciousness, it was time for the morning praising. She was quiet. She wouldn't speak to anyone. But after the morning prayers, she called all the servants of God and began to speak. And she said, I went in a trance. The Spirit of God took me and... She said the first thing that happened was, I went to hell. I was taken to hell. Then they remembered. What was the first thing they saw? Her face becoming dark. Then she said, the Lord took me to hell. And I was very shocked what I saw in hell. She said, in hell I saw many of our believers. They all died as our believers. We even buried them as our believers. But I saw them there. And God told me four reasons why they were there. They were all people with so many sins in their lives. Secret sins, hidden sins. They were not putting their lives right. They were continuing in all these wrong things. But they were in church. They were believers probably doing all their ministries. But you see where they have gone. Then from hell, God took her to heaven and showed her the beauties. Then they remembered how they saw the darkness leave her face and they saw a brightness cover her face. Seeing visions is also an experience. Your young men, even children, 
I know of children. So many beautiful experiences we have had in our tearing meetings in India and even in the UK where children. I remember when I was in, in my first church, God sent a revival among the children. And children began to receive the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in tongues and they began to see visions. Children began to see visions. This was all the Lord's doing and it was marvelous in our eyes. God must really revive that experience to be able to see visions. The fifth experience is called dreams. God can speak to us through our dreams as well. Now, Joseph in the Bible was called a dreamer because he was a person who often dreamed. And God used to speak very clearly through his dreams. Not only Joseph, there were others also. For example, King Solomon. God actually appeared to King Solomon and spoke to him in a dream. You just read 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3 verse 5. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. See, God very clearly speaks to King Solomon in a dream by night and says, You ask what I shall give thee. So Solomon was having a very vivid dream. Now seeing dreams, is it also a Pentecostal experience? Yes. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, you read the rest of that verse. Acts chapter 2 verse 17. And your old men shall dream, dream dreams. That's right. So dreaming dreams is also scriptural. You don't have to literally look at it as only old people. Because it, sons and daughters speaks of those who have begun their Pentecostal life. Old people are those who are mature spiritually. They are The Lord can speak to them very clearly even through dreams. Now, I'm not saying that we can go by every dream that we see. I want to give you a word of caution there. Every dream that you see must not immediately be thought, this is from God. We cannot go by every dream. It has to be corroborated by the word of God. And we need to know really if this is from the Lord or not. So don't just go automatically by every dream. Because the Bible also cautions us, he says, a dream cometh by the multitude of business. Meaning, in your, when you are very involved in something, then you can see it. Because it's your brain still awake, still carrying those thoughts and it's active in your sleep. It can be the product of your own imagination. It doesn't always have to be from God. If you are a person all the time thinking of somebody, that person may appear to you in your dream. Don't straight away say, the Lord said. You need to know. Sometimes, when we are all the time involved in some work, then even when we fall asleep, we are still in that mode. I remember many years ago, in one of our faith homes. In those days we didn't have much help. And all the work had to be done by the servant of God. That was a training center. And the brothers and the sisters were working very hard. I was trained in those places so I know how hard the work can get. Sometimes we have to work for 10 hours non-stop in 45 degree uh, environment. And baking hot sun and bodies really is being cooked and uh, by the end of the day, we are really tired and feet bleeding. And we hardly have about an hour or two to sleep and then we are woken up for praising. No, no rest in the morning. 3.45, we have to wake up even if you've gone to sleep at 3 o'clock. 3.45, we are up. It's rigorous training. And there was a time when there was building work going on, construction. And if those of you who have seen how it happens there, you know. The people are supposed to stand in a queue. They, they line up from where the sand is heaped right up to the construction spot. And in these little bowls or, or thing, they fill up the sand and they pass it. One person passes to the next. The next person passes. And they keep on 
passing these concrete bows and it just you just do that the whole day are doing that receiving giving receiving giving and that's how the sand is passed later they pass bricks like that it's all through and some of our sisters you know they were also involved from morning to night and i remember what time when by the time the work over it was late in the night and they hardly had any time to sleep and they came for the morning praising and this one sister she came for the praising and she fell asleep she put her head down and she went to sleep her bible was in front of her her head was down she was knocked out the sister next to her shook her and woke her up she woke up picked up her bible and threw it why all through the day this is what she is doing all through the day she was doing this and when she was woken up she just continued what she was doing only this time with the bible so sometimes we do that so we don't just go by our what our brain tells us even in our sleep we must be able to discern the voice of god sixthly god speaks to us even through practical situations through our experiences i've told you before how one beautiful saint of god whose name was brother lawrence who has written a book if you have never read that book if you've got a few euros to invest please go and spend it on that book it's called the practice of the presence of god buy that book and read it and you will see it's a daily writing of a saint of god and his experience with god how was he saved he was saved by looking at a tree he was sitting in the garden and he was just looking at a tree the tree was dead it was winter and then it was just fin- the winter had just passed and out of that dead piece of timber log where there was no life he saw new life sprout and suddenly through that he knew god was speaking he was saved through that experience even in my personal life i've had god speaking to me through various experiences instead of saying my child i care for you god can do it through an experience and when that experience happens when i was in my training first year you know that's all so strict and i remember one one day i was lying down so tired in my room and i felt very hungry you know sometimes you feel hungry for a particular thing now i'm going to tell you what that thing is but i don't want you to think i like it okay so that is the 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 indian sweet called the laddu which they give there and you know it so happened uh, that day i said god i want some laddu i was just thinking it in my mind and uh, finally i couldn't bear it i i looked around and asked a brother do you have any sweets he said yes yes i've got something and he went and pulled out something it's so colorful there was pink and there was green and i think there was yellow and blue as well and later i discovered that it was all mold it was actually an old dried piece of bread covered with fungus and i thought okay so god is this all that i can get but i didn't open my mouth i just said i fell asleep i was very tired i just lay down hardly slept when someone tapped me brother get up get up get up i said what is it they have sent this for you from the kitchen sent something for me from the kitchen no that doesn't happen normally i am in my first year they won't do anything like that no no they just said this is for you so i looked and there was this bowl big bowl full of laddus i said god do you think if i put my hand and hum jump 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 eight ten of them and went back to sleep i'll tell you god would have smashed my face in i i couldn't eat them i said god did you actually did you actually hear me what does that verse say call unto me and i will answer i didn't know and here i was just just saying that and here was god just showing me even in the midst of all that work he was in argentina he was in 
South India, he was in Australia, he was doing so many things everywhere, so many conventions going on and here, some stupid little fellow asks for some stupid little thing and God pays attention. From that experience, I knew he cared for me. I have also shared with you another experience. Some of you have shared about the button example. That was the most outstanding example in my first year because... You know, you've begun this ministry, you've left everything. You've left your house, you've left your family, you've left everything to follow him. And sometimes you get this little thing. God, do you really care for me? Do you, are you really like watching me? Do I mean anything to you? And, and it was my experience in there in that, that Indian robe that we wear. We have buttons and they're not normal buttons. They are different kind of buttons that they, they just break so easily. And I had three buttons, and two of them broke, and I didn't know what to do. I said, God, I need buttons, what do I do? Shall I go and ask? I could ask, but then for a moment I thought, Lord, can I trust in you? Would, would you give it to me? So I prayed and said, Lord, I want you to provide buttons for me. It was a Saturday. And we were working in the garden, and we were pushing these huge vehicles up and down, and cleaning the garden and guess what I found in the garden I found a button it was chipped it was brown and I said okay thank you God um, alright if this is what you've given we, we say thanks for everything isn't it after all in everything give thanks thank you Lord and God you're a king and I need a button and uh, is this Okay, I should murmur. Okay, I took it, I put it in my pocket. I said, okay, if this is what God gives, I'll be satisfied. I came back. Sunday morning service. I had to somehow adjust my clothes with safety pins and, you know, so that people don't notice. And then I went for the meeting. The meeting was over. And we have a certain tata, as they called him in Madras, 85 years old, a deaf person, he sits in the front, he's so deaf that they say he's stone deaf, he can't hear a sound and he's partly blind also and he comes to the meeting, he sits in that corner, he, does, I mean, he has his own little private devotion with the Lord and he goes away. He has nothing to do with us, we have nothing to do with him and he came and sat there. We all finished the Sunday morning service, I had played the guitar for the meeting and I was putting the guitar in its case away. When we all heard the voice of that man, and I tell you, when people are deaf, they don't know how to speak softly. And he started, Hey, where is that person? And they asked, Who am I talking about? That, that, that brother who played the guitar, where is he? He doesn't know me. So they said, It looks like he's calling you. Now, that's like Obama is calling me or something. It's like somebody I don't know. Is it me? Yeah, yeah, he wants you. So I went up to him and said, I'm the one who played the guitar. You, I, they're saying, you want me? Yeah, 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 I want you. Here, here. He put something in my hand and he walked away. What does he have to give me? I opened it. I found 16 brand new buttons. I said, God, what is this? See, God picks up the last person under the sun who should know my need. He's deaf, he's blind, he doesn't know me. What is God trying to say to me? My child, I care for you. I'm watching. God speaks through experiences. Now, it's not always been you know, sweet. Sometimes he rebukes us through experiences. He scolds us, he corrects us. But we must hear the voice of God even through experiences. There we must know, my God is speaking to me. Finally, the seventh way that God speaks is through the sermons. Now some people are waking up. Oh, is this also a way of God speaking? Because I've been watching some faces throughout the sermon. You are not paying attention. You are not paying attention at all. Some of you are paying attention. Some of you are not paying attention. One thing, children are children and we can't stop them from making their noises. But we don't have to be distracted by them. But so many adults, 
they don't pay attention to the word of god the sermon is over and i told you when i was a little child i used to love the sound of the tambourine not during the worship but at the end of the sermon because when the pastor is finishing a sermon the worker sisters they know when he's finishing it so the sister will get the drum ready and the sister gets the tambourine ready and invariably we hear the ksh, that noise so i it just got engraved in my head in my system when you hear a tambourine sound during the sermon it means the sermon is finishing that last sermon is finishing that's why i used to that's the only time i used to pay attention the rest of the sermon i don't know what happened i used to play book cricket talk to my friends go to sleep that's when i was a child but how how many adults are like that if i ask for some notebooks and when i look at the notes of some of uh, the boys you know when i ask them show me your notes i see a face in this corner and a leaf in that corner they doodling all the time that means the sermon is boring but some adults don't write notes they don't listen they 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 are some completely disconnected if i ask you at the end of the meeting okay today anyone who comes and stands here i'm going to ask you the sermon so probably today i'll be let off okay so people don't listen if you don't listen how will god speak to you sermons are important and it's not just it's not just everything that is spoken in the sermon because there are sometimes i remember i used to have a problem because there there were believers who thought every word in the sermon is for them sometimes the sermon is a hard rebuke for a backslider and i used to often have this problem in the different assemblies i worked what happens at the end of the meeting the backslider says that message is not for me and he goes away happily and that poor sister who is so sincerely crying fasting for 5 days coming and she hears this may god rebuke me i don't know what to do he hates me and what do i do every word is not for you but you must hear the holy spirit speaking certain lines you can write down the whole message but there something is for you that is why once have i spoken says god but twice we hear the holy spirit also will speak to us dear children of god in the course of the message even today in the course of this message did the holy spirit speak to you some line from the sermon must have spoken to you one of these seven ways god works in the church to speak to his people how many of you have got seven out of seven god speaks to me through all seven i'm not interested in you my interest is in those who have got zero out of seven you are in a pathetic state you are in a very dangerous state nobody knows outwardly you dress well you smile well you eat well and everything is well but you are not well your soul is dying and god wants to speak to you my sheep hear my voice you have no longer you are no longer my sheep you are backsliding you are going away from me oh dear child of god today you call upon the lord lord forgive me for neglecting your voice forgive me oh god for for lord just enjoying myself and not caring oh god about my relationship with you the lord says you call upon me call unto me and i will answer we must hear his voice he is not bare if we call upon him he will speak he is a living god may god speak to each one of us shall